Hello everybody, this is uh, my office at the moment. Uh, we have to be in Spain in self-isolation and we're going to be respecting, I'm going to be respecting that. That means uh, for the next 10 days at least, possibly more, this will be where I'll be staying, apart from when I'm going shopping or in case of any emergency. So that's the plan. I'm in the Costa Brava. You may hear the wind a little bit. That's the wind over there in the sea. And that at least gives me something to entertain myself with. Listening to the wind. Or doing Ask Yem from here. So I've asked for some of your questions and some of them have been really interesting. So let me start with it straight away. Uh, Paul Gormley, but he's not the only one, is asking how do you think the Premier League will sort out the mess that coronavirus has caused? Well, the first thing to say is that this is um, a situation that's global. The epicenter of the uh, of the virus, as you know, is in Europe, and everybody's trying to sort out the way the, the way to move forward. All the games are cancelled until the um, uh, first weekend in April. Not just in the Premier League, but in La Liga as well, uh, in France, Germany, etc., in Italy. And the ones that are ahead of the curve, if you like, the ones who have been affected the earliest in Italy, they are considering the possibility of perhaps playing some games behind closed doors uh, at the end of April, uh, but certainly start uh, the league again and play it all uh, from the beginning of May until uh, mid June or uh, end of June. Now that's pure speculation. As you know, tomorrow, Tuesday, you'll have uh, a meeting of UEFA uh, with the federations, with the trade union of players and with the um, with ECA that represents the clubs with the idea of uh, define uh, uh, and design a new calendar. To be honest, nobody really knows how long this is going to go on for. And I know that uh, to be optimistic, you have to put a date uh, to have time to think about things. Uh, all the leagues have given two weeks, but from now on, people just don't know. For instance, Valencia uh, have admitted five cases of players with uh, coronavirus, and they are not the only ones. Of course, there's been cases, as you know, in the Premier League, and of course, in, in Italy as well, and, and so on. So when all that could be um, a, a playing uh, a level field, uh, we just don't know, as in, everybody has to go through it, don't they? You cannot just start if some cases, there's some teams that are in self-isolation, etc. There's so many implications to this, of course. For instance, what happens to the players whose contract finishes at the 30th of June? Uh, what happens with the uh, broadcasting money? This is interesting because, of course, uh, perhaps the broadcasters in the UK will say, actually, we only offered 75% of the uh, of the games and we paid one billion uh, uh, pounds for it so we want the money back I don't know if that's happened yet but I know that in Italy my understanding is that the broadcasters will not ask for the money back uh, as they already have the money from subscriptions which means of course that they won't give the money back from for those that have subscribed and will not get football uh, from now on till we don't know yet when so those are situations to be to be sorted. There is so many legalities. What do you do with the leagues? And there is no easy answer right now. We just don't know. Um, the uh, Spanish league is saying we will play to the end, meaning that at some point games will take place. Uh, the uh, Champions League could be uh, perhaps just one game uh, per uh, per round, and then uh, people are suggesting. Uh, the four semi-finalists to play for the to be the champions in Istanbul, but we don't know when. Of course, for all that to work, you have to have the um, the champions. Sorry, the European Championships moved to 2021, which the under my understanding is that uh, that's what everybody favours right now to clear time for the uh, for the league. What extraordinary time for living in that we have to discuss this kind of thing. Unbelievable. Sometimes I wake up and think, right, is the new episode of the science fiction. Uh, series that we're part of, uh, is it on now or, or, you know, am I waking up from a dream? So for instance, Catalin Tibre is saying the same, what is your view on the current situation in football? Should all the domestic leagues be cancelled and start a fresh season in September? Resume when safe to do so. I put the um, picture of how things are. My view is that there are some cases where you should hand over the title. I'm thinking of Liverpool, hand it over. And perhaps then 
give the possibility of uh, the two teams that are doing better in the championships to go up and then do some kinds of playoffs when it's possible for the rest. Uh, so perhaps do a bigger competition than the usual 22 teams, maybe. Um, now, there are other cases where things are not clear. It's two points separating Barcelona and Real Madrid. It's, I think, five points separating Borussia Dortmund from, uh, from Bayern Munich. Um, PSG hand over the title to. Uh, in Juventus, Juventus, Lazio, only one point separating them, I think. Uh, those things have to be sorted on the pitch. There are some clear cases where you can just give the title to and then the rest has to be agreed amongst everybody. It will be a majority and there will be people that won't be, un will be happy with it. But we are living in extraordinary times, extraordinary measures have to be decided and extraordinary attitudes as well will be important right from, from, the, from now. To communicate or learn to communicate in different ways, uh, that's the future for the journalist. Uh, so you can adapt to whatever technology is the latest one or, or where you think you can send your message better. Uh, in terms of newspapers, I'm convinced they are dead. There'll be no much paper um, that you can hold uh, in the near future. Like now, for instance, Sport, the paper I work for, uh, they still uh, produce and print the paper uh, in, in, in paper. Uh, because the news news uh, desks are the news the kiosks are still open, so you can go and buy it. But I'm pretty sure that from now on, most people will actually try to find the PDF of it, the version of it in the apps that you can get, like Kiosko Imas, for instance, or, or others. And you can download the newspapers I'm doing with the Times as well. Uh, that to me has been the way to read papers for a long while. And I do like going on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, afternoon when the sun is shining, have a bit of a, a coffee or something and a croissant and get the real paper. I like that feeling, but for most of the new generations, that won't be part of their memories. So no need to do that. Uh, that does, that's for me the biggest change. You will have to adapt what's coming uh, and what's coming will have to do with uh, the way you communicate. And as we can see, I think people are becoming very aware of what's clickbait and what's not what is proper journalism and what's not. That is always going to be the case. So we had to go through that period of ter turbulent period like you do on a plane where you just have to put the, uh, the belt on and uh, go through it, where you get, you, know, you get accused of all things, where you get trolls, where you get all those kind of things. But now everything has been filtered out. Uh, I'm starting to um, enjoy much more the communication with the, uh, with the audience that I've got in through my uh, social media, which is like 1.2 million or something. Uh, and uh, in different formats uh, and trying to understand myself also how I can be of service to what is, could be interesting for for instance in the next few days weeks months perhaps where I'm going to be uh, here <laughs> and uh, you perhaps in the UK at some point will have to be self-isolated as well when well, I'm preparing um, the uh, podcast new uh, drops of the podcast the pure football podcast um, with good stuff I don't want to say it yet, but uh, some of it is already out there. Is Eddie Jones and Gary Southgate uh, is the uh, is the latest episode. Uh, the next one is Tony Ann Wayne and uh, Asmir Begovic, two goalkeepers, talking about being a goalkeeper. Fascinating conversation. Uh, you'd be surprised about what goes through the mind of those of those goalkeepers and how different they are to the rest. Not just about being mental, crazy. Uh, but about how they prepare themselves, the fact that they dress differently, that they have to think differently about the game, the consequences of their mistakes, etc. So all that is the Pure Football podcast. There is other episodes as well, which I'm going to uh, cl get clips from. And there is even a new Twitter account. Uh, the, um, uh, the account is at Pure Football Pod, and you'll get the, all the information of all the episodes coming out. So that's what I'm going to try to be doing, plus maintaining this and a surprise that I'll have in the YouTube channel um, from the end of this week. Uh, something that, uh, let me do it first. And if I'm happy with it, I'll put it on and then you tell me if it's something you'd be interested in or not. Jordan Lee is saying, thoughts on United's rebuild. Early to say it, quite clearly there is a plan. There's no argument about that. There is a plan and uh, there's a plan with consequences. The, the team is doing well and you know, still Pogba is not there. It's interesting that the noise that we're hearing is that Pogba now wants to stay. Uh, we'll see if that's the case or part of a new strategy. I don't think it's a priority for Real Madrid. 
uh, with other intentions uh, for them. In any case, um, if Pogba starts thinking about staying at the club, what I have known for a long while is that he is a good leader and you may be surprised about this. He's very professional in the way he approaches things. Perhaps in social media it doesn't look so. He perhaps doesn't deal well with, um, with conflict and difficult situations, so not the perfect leader, but uh, he's demanding to everybody, the coaches and the players as well. And perhaps he will mature to become the leader that Manchester United needs. It'd be interesting if he stays because it does look like this Manchester United are progressing now, uh, another discussion, if it's in the good hands or not, it seems to be in the case of the club that they decided they are in good hands, in which case there's no much to, to argue there. And, uh, and the, we will see in a few months' time if they are right or, or not. Derek, uh, Derek J. Viva, hello Derek, uh, says, what's your favorite Beagles or United game? And of course, it has to be one that I was looking at recently. You must remember, we all do the Saffron Walden game at home uh, and for the FA Cup and how uh, we came from behind to actually score in the last second, a 4-4 uh, draw that had us all on the edge of our seats. In fact, I was standing up for most of the game, but it was one to remember the uh, emotions of everybody, the reactions of everybody. To me, it was very emotional to see that everybody was so close to what was happening on the pitch, how the coaches were running to celebrate for the fourth goal. Kike, uh, of course, our Spanish player who was with us for a few months at the beginning of the season, was the one of the fourth goal. And uh, all in all, it was just a magnificent day to everybody and the reinforced what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is progress. Frank Ostancio, who also has been a key part of Picasso United as director of football for many years and my right-hand man too. He's asking for uh, three moments uh, that stayed in my memory and will never forget, of course, the three of them in football. It has to be one of them has to be the World Cup final uh, in Joburg. Unbelievable moments. Uh, I never thought in my lifetime I could see uh, Spain winning the World Cup, but certainly one. Two, uh, Espanyol winning any of the two FA Cups, the two Cups, Copa del Rey, uh, that was 2000-2006 uh, and both of them were again against the odds uh, and, and we did it in a way that it was not expected against Zaragoza and against Atletico Madrid uh, in Valencia and in Madrid and it was celebrated long into the night and the third one it has to do with Vigas or United. And there's not just one moment, just every time I walk into the, um, into, the, into the clubhouse and I see people, some of them with a scarf, who have come from sometimes long way to, uh, to see the match. When I see the players on time, I see them sharing jokes, I see them getting into the pitch, a game starting. Honestly, every single time, there's like a, something in my throat. Um, and, uh, and you know, makes me very happy. Uh, Before Bea says, uh, will the Spanish FA declare Barcelona's championship if La Liga is cancelled to a conclusion? What I said, La Liga actually wants to keep playing. They want to play, keep playing and they want to do it uh, to the end. So that's the only, that's La Liga, the only possibility that they're working on. The Spanish Federation, on the other hand, who will have the last word if, uh, if things get cancelled in terms of what happens with them, um, trophies and they said they will give information on that very soon uh, it will be if it gets cancelled it would be the federation so they say who will take the decision of who goes down or if anybody goes down and also wins the title so right now the possibility of handing it over to barcelona like that is not there because la liga is uh, is thinking we will play yes or yes that's the only possibility they're working on the federation of course have got different uh, possibilities if that's the case which are similar to the ones that uh, you're hearing in Italy, for instance, uh, declare it void, finish it uh, with the last game that has been played, or playing playoffs if there was the time. All that has been considered. But right now, and where we stand, we just cannot take definite conclusion of it. So we're going to see how it all progresses. March in Bounce Back, and then lots of letters, uh, says, what is the one memory of football you have, either as a fan or a journalist, that you took your breath away? Uh, it's similar to what I was saying earlier, but if I had to ask for another one, 
my interview. No, I'll tell you what. The moment I asked Pep Guardiola if I could do, if uh, if he was happy with me doing a book, and uh, he said yes. Uh, later on, I said, "Well, would you read some of it?" Because uh, I'm talking about you and the way you think. I said, "No, you do whatever you need to do." They opened the doors for me for that uh, book, uh, Another Way of Winning. Uh, the whole of Barcelona was opening. Well, it was a difficult year uh, because it was the battles with uh, Jose Mourinho. You must all remember. Uh, when he was at Real Madrid, but still could talk to anybody. And as a consequence, the book came out. But as I said, when I asked for the possibility of him reading some of it, he said, no, I'll just go and buy the book in the in the bookstore, whatever, whenever it's out. So a lot of responsibility and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, happiness of hearing that I had the freedom, uh, as I had had in all the books to do whatever I wanted. Sibain is saying, if you had one piece of advice for someone looking to get into sports journalism, what would that be? The first one, and I, I told this to many young journalists, is we are a microphone. That's all we are. A microphone that we put in front of people for them to talk. And then we transform that into a story. We, 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 we put it together uh, in whatever way and format we want. But first and foremost, we are a microphone. The confusion of uh, young journalists these days is that they want to have an opinion and that's what they want to be contract for to give an opinion forgetting that uh, the ones that do get paid for giving opinions is like one percent of the whole uh, journalistic profession uh, mostly uh, as i've done for many 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 years uh, it's, it's about reporting putting a microphone in front of people and uh, and just listen to what they have to say if you don't forget that, including when you start getting paid for giving opinions, you'll be very close to what the essence of journalism is. Tom Squirrel says, was being an Espanol supporter choice or was it by birth? And which was the best Espanol team you have seen? Oh, good question. Uh, my dad was, um, was an Espanol fan and I presume that the whole world was because he was. And then I realized that there are other teams when I grew older. In fact, there was a game in which um, uh, Barcelona lost badly. Let me let me get this right. I think uh, um, I, I've got the impression. I've, I've, my memory is failing me now, but I've got the impression that um, uh, Espanol was and because of my dad, my team. But I became a Barcelona fan because when I went to school, everybody was a Barcelona fan. But then. Uh, there was a moment, I think 1973, I seem to remember. It was, I think it was a friendly where Espanol beat Barcelona very clearly. And I will listen that to the radio. I always listen to the radio when I'm, when I'm watching football, even when I'm on television, always listen to the radio. And of course, radio is a massive uh, medium in, in Spain. And, uh, and I remember Espanol actually beating Barcelona clearly, 5-1 or something like that, or 7-3, I can't know, 7-3 must be the year, 73. 5-1 or something like that. And I thought, oh, Espanol is a better side. So, I went back to be an Espanol fan and uh, even though we've been in the second division twice and we're close to be again in the second division, it's something you don't move from. But I must admit, being honest, nothing matters more than a good result of Beagles or United. Absolutely nothing. Funny how football goes, eh? And your alliances and what you end up loving in, in the game. Darren says, what's Aitor Karanka doing now and where do you think he might be Managing next, and uh, he's very grateful, Darren, of what he did at Middlesbrough. And you know what? I thought knows that. He's very aware of that. Uh, I, a very famous Middlesbrough fan told me just before, on the last day at work in the office, uh, I heard that Karanka is thinking of going back to Middlesbrough. I said, well, I will ask. I haven't, so I will. But uh, I think he's waiting for the right project. He's had offers all over the place. And he wants us to be somewhere where what is a good choice for him and for the club. And he's allowed to do a job. Not just, um, he doesn't need to really just uh, get, a, get a job done somewhere and save a team or, or just take advantage of a good moment of a team. He just wants to actually have a project, something that he can mold to what he believes in. That's the plan. And at the moment, he hasn't chose, chose one. Joe Morris is asking, will Cazorla make a return to Arsenal? It's interesting because I spoke to Santi not so long ago and uh, he hasn't renewed his contract with Villarreal, which finishes at the end of the season. And uh, 
basically what may happen is that um, he wants two more years playing. Two more years playing. Now, going back to Arsenal, where Mikel Arteta is, is something that I think he would consider as a coach. I asked him about it. He said yes, he would consider it as a coach when he retires, but he wants to play for two more years. And I tell you all, Mikel Arteta and Cazorla together, really good friends, first of all, but really good special minds of football. Lionel is saying, LX Lionel says, which player of which team or match made you love football? You will, you will not remember, but uh, there are players at Espanyol that made me love the game. Uh, Tamudo is one of them. Pochettino and the way he, he uh, led with that long hair and the captain. Um, Gavino, a player that came from Betis, loved to dribble and hardly ever managed to get to where he wanted to, but it was exciting. Lauritsen as well. Uh, Valverde, when he played for Espanyol, Lauritsen was a genius as well, so such an elegant midfielder. Those were the guys that uh, made me fall in love with, with, with football. And, uh, oh, he's also asking the greatest book you ever read. The greatest book, the greatest book. It won't be a football book, I don't think. Uh, I go back a lot to a book called, uh, by Barico, called Silk. Very tiny little book. And uh, I think it makes you fall in love with reading. There's so many more. And we can talk about books and series and movies in the next few weeks if you wanted to. The last one, Morgan Kierans. I'm sure you've asked this question before, but what's the best autobiography in sport that you read? Agassiz, autobiography. He is so sincere and difficult to read sometimes, but he does tell you everything you, know, you need to know about elite uh, athletes. They're not all the same, but they don't all enjoy what they're doing and they do stroll uh, as well often. Um, always fascinated by that side of things, side of things that you don't get to hear so much. So that was this week's Ask Guillem, and uh, I'll leave it out there. If you have more questions, put it down in the um, in the comments on Twitter or uh, Instagram or uh, YouTube, and I'll be more coming next week. Yes, I'm not moving from here. <laughs> oh, what? By the way, uh, I've dressed elegantly for you. But I just thought I'd show you that, you know, the magic of television. I make sure that uh, I'm comfortable at home. I wear normally pajamas. So that's what I'm going to be doing. On one hand, I'll still be uh, my professional self. On the other, I have to be casual. I'm home. <laughs> See you later. Bye.